and hopefully we'll get things straightened out at some point but for now it looks like there's a yellow tint for that so what I want to do first of all is I want to um, bring up Eclipse and talk a little bit about that because I tried to show some of that last time but unfortunately with the setup the way it was last time and I didn't have the right adapter uh, we weren't able to show you a clip so I, I want to go and, and do that um, it's kind of interesting that that it's easier to find another computer than it is to find another adapter uh, but that's how it goes sometimes and still apparently I don't have the right adapter because it's not showing correct but at least we can we can go into this has anyone tried installing the Android stuff on there work not work works you can get into the examples okay what you want to do is you want to make sure that you get into the examples and run them either through an emulator or through a device and I'll show you what you can do to test yourself to make sure that what you have works so there is a URL in the book to download the examples from the Deedle text so you go there you can download the examples you then will start up Eclipse losing it here you start up Eclipse you have a screen that looks like this all right you go to file import and then pick existing project into workspace because we already have code for this so it would be an existing project click next you navigate to where you put the uh, examples from Deedle and in my case I have a folder called code examples original and you pick any of the um, any of the ones on the list the welcome one is the simplest one and we'll start off looking at that one today and then we'll move on um, and, and talk more uh, more Java stuff so click on welcome to open it <coughs> click on finish and it will import it all right what you can do then is either you can run the emulator or on this particular laptop which is an old laptop the emulator we don't have enough time in this class to start up the emulator and run it actually I've, I've only a couple of times got the emulator to even run it times out usually before uh, it runs so I almost always use uh, my mobile device to do this so you would simply go and right mouse on this and say run as Android application it'll take a little while to connect to the device Actually, it's showing me an error here. There may be a problem with the version.
now it is firing up. On occasion, depending on your Android device and what it was set for, um, you'll get errors like the error that I experienced where it told you that um, the machine was configured for a, um, or the app was configured for a, a higher version of Android than the device was. not know why this is not working. All right, let me try another app here. Let me close out of this. Um, so I'll go import. Something is not working with this. Maybe because I have another app with the same name on here. Let me try getting rid of that. There we go. All right. And there we have the app. All right. And it's running there. So to review, I'm going to start over. To test to make sure your install is working, you would go in under File, Import, Find one of the examples, probably the welcome, in the um, code examples that you download from Deedle.
import it. It'll bring it into your workspace. You can open it up to see the uh, files that are in it. Then run as Android application and away you go. And it comes up. I already had a different application called Welcome on here. I think that's what was um, dragging me down the first time. All right. So that's what you want to do after you get it installed. If you can do that, then you're ready to roll. What could go wrong with it? Well, the target version that you have for the application could be higher than either the virtual device that you've created or the actual physical device that you have. If that happens, you can go into the manifest Typically, you can go into the manifest and simply change the minimum SDK version to whatever it is. For example, this tablet, if I'm not mistaken, is running SDK version 7. So when this application was originally uploaded, it was 9. And therefore, I wasn't able to run it. I had to go and adjust that number to 7, and then everything went OK. All right. You want to make sure that you have this set, and you want to make sure you can do what I did here. And hopefully you'll even be able to do it quicker than I did it. And you won't have run into the problems of, of having to uninstall some things and all that to get it going. If you do that, then your installation is set and you're ready to proceed. All right. What I want to do now is I want to look at the components in an Android application. Um, kind of give an overview of what's in the application. After we do that, we'll spend some time reviewing because there's a couple of things that we need to review. Um, one is Java coding and one is XML. All right. If we look at the application here, you'll see there's actually a whole bunch of folders that we have. And there's some XML files. First is a manifest. The manifest is a file that is used when installing the application. It's information about the application. And it will be used when you're installing the application. It's an XML file. All right. And after we finish this, we'll talk a little bit more about the rules of XML. But for the most part, what this does is this defines what the icon for the application is. If you'll notice Android icon. It defines the label um, that the application is going to have. And it defines the title um, for the activity that we're going to invoke. And then it has some pieces of information about um, what happens when this application fires off. In general, we're not going to spend too much time looking at this. Your, most of your manifests are going to look like this. Later on in the semester, we may add some things to the manifest that will give permissions. How many of you have ever installed an application on an Android device? All right, Most of you have. It, one of the things it does is that it um, asks you um, to grant certain permissions. So for example, if, your, um, app, if the application saves things on the SD card, it will say this application is requesting being able to save things on the SD card. Or if it requires an internet connection. Or sometimes it will you know, um, let a phone call interrupt it. Or whatever. Whatever, the, there's a whole list of uh, permissions. And those permissions will be stored in the Android manifest as well. In fact, if you try to do something within your Android code and you don't have the permission set for it in the manifest file, you get an error when you go and compile it, which is, a, which is kind of a good thing, a nifty thing. Uh, that way, you know, there should be no surprises. You tell the user, for example, that you're going to be connected to the internet. So they're not surprised if there are minutes for their data plan. Uh, or, 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 or more than likely gigabytes get eaten up by this application. For 
the most part, though, this is information about the application. The icon, the name, what happens when the application starts up. So we're not going to spend too much time about this. This is stored in an XML file. How familiar are you with XML files? Can anyone give a good definition of what an XML file is? Can anyone give a bad definition of what an XML file is? XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. Now we've all probably seen markup languages before, most notably HTML. What is meant by markup is it, it, this, this language uses tags to communicate meaning. All right. It's extensible because you can really define a format for any kind of data you want to using XML. It's not limited. So if I was a library and I wanted to communicate with other libraries about the books I have, I could define a book markup language, book ML, that would describe maybe what the tags would look like to have information about a book. You know, maybe there'd be a tag that was book. And one of the tags underneath book might be title. And a tag underneath the book also could be authors. And underneath the author ta uh, tag could be the author name and the author date they were born and the uh, date that they died and where they were born and all that. So you could come up with a set of tags that defined your book markup language and then you could use that to communicate with other libraries or, or anyone who wanted to know what you had. Many of the files in Android development are done as XML files. And the thing to remember about XML files is it's very similar to HTML in that you have tags the tags need to be properly nested Just like in HTML, which means that a tag that starts in a tag, it also has to end within it. So you can't have tags that sort of overlap each other. Every starting tag has to have an ending tag. That's a little different than HTML because with HTML you can cheat and you cannot put some ending tags in and, and you'll be okay. But with XML, the rule is, is that it has to be um, an ending tag for every starting tag. And every XML file has sort of one root tag. So you can think of this as a tree coming out from one root. Now if we look at this Android manifest file, we'll see that the manifest is the root node of this. Underneath the manifest, there's an application tag. Underneath the application tag, there's an activity. And inside the activity, there is an intent filter that has an action and a category. Tags, just like in HTML, can have attributes. All right. And therefore, for example, here on this manifest tag, we specify the namespace we're using for Android. We'd specify the package that the code is going to be in, the Android version, and so on down the line. Now, you'll notice a couple things that are a little bit different here. Notice that for the icon, it says at drawable slash icon is the name of the icon. Where is that located? Well, if we look in the resources, there is a series of folders called Drawable. Drawable HDPI, 
drawable LDPI, drawable MDPI. And each one of them has an icon.png. This is one of the cool things about Android applications is your code doesn't have to worry about things such as screen density or screen size or language or anything like that. A lot of what's accomplished in Android is done via resource files. So, I have different icons depending on whether it's a high density, a low density, or a medium density. And we'll talk more about screen densities as the class progresses, but in essence, for a high density uh, uh, device, you're going to have a bigger icon. All right. For a low density device, you're going to have a smaller icon. And medium one's going to be right smack dab in the middle. So automatically, depending on the kind of device that you have installed this on, you're going to get the appropriate icon. And that is expressed by saying at drawable icon. And the HDPI, the LDPI, and the MDPI are called resource qualifiers because that tells Android what, where to get the resources from on a particular device. It automatically knows, right. In fact, there's all sorts of resource qualifiers. Um, there's resource qualifiers for screen density, which relates to how tightly the, te the pixels are packed. All right. There's a, a uh, you, can, you can set up a resource qualifier for screen size. Right? Now that's a little bit different, right? It's not how dense they're packed, but how many pixels there are. All right. There are resource uh, qualifiers for language. So for example, you could have a set of labels. If you had an application and you wanted to make it multilingual, you could have a set of labels in English in your resource file, then have a French version of that resource file for the labels in French, Spanish version of it for the labels in Spanish, and so on down the line. And again, the device will automatically know, hey, the language for this device is English, so it will use the labels from the English file. Or if the language was set to be Spanish on a device, it will know to use the Spanish ones. So yeah. This is sort of a nice aspect of that, is some of the variances between the different kinds of devices and language and that sort of thing. Actually, you don't have to like code that kind of knowledge in there. Like if any of you have done any like responsive HTML programming, you kind of like have to code uh, it in there to say if the screen's a certain size and use the style sheet or whatever. Here you simply define the resources and Android's smart enough to know to apply the appropriate resources to that. So we actually could have different versions of all these images. These are three images that appear in this uh, application. The Android symbol, the bug, and the icon. We could have different versions of them for low, for, for low density and for high density, but, but we don't. Another thing that you'll see is you will see this at string an awful lot. All right. What that means is that again is referring to anytime you see the at sign in front of some thing, it's referring to a particular resource file. So in this case, at string is pulling it from this values folder. Inside that values folder, there's a string.xml. And if we open that guy up, and look at it, you'll see that there's a string with an attribute of a name of hello that's called hello world welcome. The string with an attribute name of app name is the word welcome. Finally, there's a welcome message, a string with a name of welcome that says welcome to Android app development. So we're never going to hard code strings in our program. Any hard coded string we want, we're going to put in the strings XML file in just this manner. So if I had a label 
if I had a text box with a label that said name, I wouldn't hard code anywhere in my Android thing, I wouldn't hard code the word name. I would instead associate that with a value in my string file. This makes, this, this adds all kinds of value to the code. It makes it very, very maintainable, right? Because if you go to an application and you want to internationalize it, you don't have to scour through all these different classes. You simply go and you create, you get someone that knows the other language and they simply translate all the labels in that string to you. And you create another copy of that strings file with the resource qualifier saying that it's for French or it's for Spanish or whatever. So, huge advantage to doing that. The other thing it does is it ensures consistency. All right. So, for example, you know, if you're going to call something the name or the, the, the user ID or whatever, you put that string in one place, everywhere will use that string value and therefore you can guarantee consistency. So wherever you're using that, that label, you're getting the exact same value. So, we're never going to hard code a string. All right, we're always going to put it in the strings file. And then we can refer to it using that syntax that we, we showed in the manifest file to say at string slash app name. What that's going to do is that's going to look in the string resource file and then pull the value of the string that has a name of app name. Um, it, it's similar in the sense that for maintainability reasons we're separating that out. And that way we can change one thing, we, we can do some changes to the UI without messing up the processing language. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, exactly, this is, um, how do I want to put this? These resources files, there's resources files for a lot of different things, and one of them is your string labels, one of them as we saw would be your, your uh, um, images, uh, or drawables, as they're, they're called. Um, the other thing that we're going to find is layouts, that we're going to look at in a minute. We can have multiple layouts. All right. So, manifest file has information about the app. The strings file contains um, a list of all the string labels, hard-coded string labels that you're going to use in your app. And we'll always refer to them. That way it's easy to change, easy to swap out. The drawable folders, which are under resources, all these are under resources, by the way, uh, are going to contain your images. And this is the first example we've seen of a resource qualifier where we don't have just one drawable folder, we have three drawable folders depending on the screen density. So we have a high density uh, set of, of uh, files, we then also have a low density and a medium density. The last thing we have is we have our layout is in an XML file. All right? If you want to think of this, this is your user interface. This is what the user is going to see. This is what the user is going to interact with. And just like if you're doing an HTML interface, you can have controls such as text boxes and this and that and the other. You'll put stuff, you'll put controls, or views they're called uh, in the Android world, as part of your user interface. And then your program will be able to access those and do things with them. In this case, whoops, wrong one. In this case, we have our XML file for the main layout. This is a relative layout, which means each thing is positioned with regard to some other thing on the page.
and we'll see what we mean by that in a second here. There's all sorts, there, there's several different sorts of layouts. So relative layout is one where you define where things are in relation to other things. So for example, if we look, we have a text view. All right. This actually, this app has a text view and two image views. If we pull this app back up on, on my device here. We can see that. Here's the text view. Welcome to Android app development. Here's the one image view. Here's the other image view. All right. So they're just one right after another. That's what the relative positioning means. You can define these views on the page and then you specify how they're related to each other, related in terms of position. So if we look at this, first thing we see is there's a text view. And there's all these properties. Keep in mind, my intent isn't that you have all these, properized memorized, all these properties memorized today. I just want to sort of give you an overview of the different files that you get with a Android application. So we saw the manifest and we talked about the purpose of that. We, we saw the strings XML. We saw the drawables. Now we're looking at the layout, which is again stored in an XML file. And it's a collection of, of views. So we have that text view. The text in it is, again, coming from the Android strings file. And it is the welcome text. So that is what appears in that text area, uh, text view. And if you see, sure enough, that does. So if I wanted to change this, if I wanted this app to instead say, welcome to CISS 265, uh, Android application development, I wouldn't change it in the layout, I'd change it in the strings file. So I'd go here and say, welcome to CISS 265, Android app development, I'd connect up my little device here. I'd run this again. And now It has my new text in it. Right. So again, my layout, wherever there are strings, doesn't have the hard-coded string. Instead, it points to that string resources field. We specify the size of it. We define an, whoops. We define an ID for it. Notice we have a plus ID there. That's going to add a new ID for this text area to the ID resources later on. This is important because this ID that we have defined for this text view allows us, allows for our code, our Java code, to grab a pointer to that text box and do something with it. All right? So if we want to through our code, manipulate that text box, we first have to grab it and point to it. We could have any number of text boxes on our screen. So we have to say which one we want to do something with. So we have to point to it. And the mechanism by which that's done is the ID. There's some other parameters that relate to, you know, is it the text centered, is it bold, and so on. The next element is an image view.
we give it an ID of Droid Image View. That way we can refer to it in our code. The source of that image is at drawable Android. So in other words, this PNG is going to get labeled in there. Notice for this image, we don't have different copies of the image. We don't have different versions of the image for each screen uh, resolution. We simply have one copy, so that's the one that's going to be used regardless of the screen resolution. Notice here, we have an Android layout below. This goes back to the relative layout that we're talking about here. Where do we put this image view? Well, we're putting it below the control that has an ID of welcome text view. In other words, we're putting it below this text view here. The image view for the little bug on the end is almost the same. All right. We define the resource that it comes from. The source, which is a drawable, we specify um, other parameters about it, and then finally we say that we want it to be below that other image. All right. So this is the resource section of an Android application. What do we have so far to review? We have our drawables, which are our images which we can have defined to different screen resolutions. It's a good practice to do that. Especially a good practice to do that with the icon. In this case, that's the only thing that they do it for. So we have our drawables. We have our manifest, which has information about the app, such as the app name, what to do when the app launches, and so on. We have our strings, which are all our labels in the application. So any time we want to change a label, we don't go into the code. We go into the string resource and change it there. And then finally, we have our layout file. All right. And which is an XML file which consists of a set of views. Pretty much everything in, uh, on an Android UI is called a view. So uh, there's a text view. There is a image view and so on down the line. So these are all the resources, but the code is what brings everything together and fires up when the application fires up. So we'll be worried about this folder. The, the, the gen folder is stuff that gets generated. This is the Android framework and Eclipse libraries. There's some other assets that we can put in there. The bin is where we're going to uh, compile the application. The other thing that we're going to spend a lot of time in, though, is the source. All right? And our source is we're going to define a package for it. A package should be something that um, uniquely qualifies your class anywhere in the world. Usually, they use this sort of what's called a reverse domain notation. So for example, this example, which is an example from Deedle, the package name is com.deedle. Now, there's no other organization in the world that has a URL or the domain of deedle.com, right? They should be the only ones because that corresponds to a web URL and they should be the only ones that have it. So they've guaranteed that it's unique. All right. This particular application has a single welcome class. It extends the activity class in Android. When I talk about these applications, typically one screen that appears and either shows the user something or asks the user to do something is an activity. If when you press a button, it takes you to another screen, that's a second activity. So all your applications will have at least one activity. And in this case, this is the main activity, which starts up when the application runs. All right.
And effectively what it does is, there's several methods that exist on the activity class. What this particular code does is, it does some things to remember some parameters about it. And all this does is it sets the content view for this activity. So, in other words, what this is doing is this is taking that screen layout that we defined in our resources, in our layout folder, in main.xml, it takes that layout and displays that as the activity screen, as the content view for that. So this isn't a particularly exciting application. It doesn't really do anything other than display its main screen. But it is useful in showing the different parts of this. All right, We have the resource files and then we have an activity. And one of the things an activity is always going to do is it's going to set the, um, the main for uh, the, 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 the content view to whatever the main layout is. In this case, it's in a file called main.xml. Any questions about any of this? Let's spend a little bit of time reviewing some Java stuff. Let me see. Let me see what other applications I have here. Yeah, not um, for Mac though. Um, this something's going on with this because it. Uh, if we go to this, it's yellowish tint.
Okay, maybe we can uh, address it after after class. Uh, yeah, it's okay. There's not much I can do there. Okay, all right. Yeah, maybe after after class you can take a look at that. All right. Um, let's see. Let's do some Java review. What is a class in Java? How would you define a class in Java or in, really in any object oriented programming language? Go ahead. All right. So, a object, or, or I'm sorry, a class is a structure that typically models something in the real world. It either models something within the application or it models something in the real world. So for example, if you were doing a school application, you might have a student class because there's students in the real world. And therefore the software model of a student would be um, a student class. As Ben said, classes have two things. Um, classes have attributes or properties, and they have methods or functions. Um, the, one, the, the Java textbook that we use, the head first uh, textbook, says that objects know things and can do things. All right? And for example, a property for a student might be your name. So. That's, that's a characteristic. Every student has one, right? A characteristic of a student might be a name. Address, phone number, email address. All these are properties of a student and would be defined as properties in a student class. Um, a method would be some sort of function or some sort of capability that a student can do. For example, a student can enroll in a class. A student can drop a class. You can ask a student class what's the student's GPA, and that can be calculated. All right. And again, I'm using the example of student, but it could apply to, to any um, sort of uh, any sort of of entity uh, in either within an application or even in the real world. All right. What does it mean when we inherit a class? What does inheritance mean? Okay. Uh, when we inherit something, all right, when we have a subclass, in other words, of inherit, another word for inheriting is saying a subclass. Sometimes we'll say a child class. What that means, it has all the characteristics of the parent class, plus it can have some new characteristics, it can have some new behaviors, or it can do other behaviors differently. All right, so let's look at In our welcome example, we have a case of inheritance. Because if we look, welcome.java public class extends activity. So, what that means is within the Android framework, there's a class called activity. And activities can do certain things, all right? Have certain methods on them, all right? 
What we can do, however, is we can override for this particular view. Another war, uh, way of, of uh, another term that's used to describe inheritance is specialization. All right. So, for example, in the Android framework, an activity is sort of the very ger uh, general, very generic activity. It's meant to represent all possible activities. This, however, is a specialized version of it. It doesn't represent all activities. It just represents this one activity, this little welcome splash screen that pops up on your device. Okay? So, it's a more specialized version. We're not talking about all. We're talking about this specific one. And because this is a specialized version, we can override. And notice what we're doing here is we're overriding the onCreate method for the activity. The activity has a method called onCreate and we're overriding it here. The code in the framework for the activity is probably something very generic. Here we want to spe uh, specify exactly what we want to do in this particular special case for this specific activity. What do we want to do? Well, we want to set the content view, so we call that method, and we set the content view to this screen, the main.xml. So we're extending the generic activity and make it do something special in our case. All right. Let's see another example of an activity that uses another class. Okay, I've written a real simple tip calculator. There is a tip calculator in the book application. This is an even simpler version of it. So this will give us a chance to do a couple things. So give us a chance to review some Java stuff, and it'll give us a chance to review the um, general aspects of an Android application. So let's look at this app. This app has a label that says simple tip calculator, has a text box for us to enter in the amount of a meal. We get to pick what level of service it was. Was it poor, average, or excellent? And then we press the button to calculate the tip, and it calculates the tip. In this case, I said that the Meal was $15, average service, it says leave a $2.25 tip, so leave a 15% tip. If I were to say poor service, don't give them any tip. If I were to say excellent service, give them a $3 tip. All right, so we give 20% for excellent service. So let's go and let's view this, and as we view this, let's pay attention to um, the Android stuff, but then let's also use it to review some of the Java concepts as well. So if we look at this, first of all, there really aren't any images, any drawables in this, other than the icon, which if we look at the icon here, is simply... This sort of, whoops, this generic icon here. Whoops, you're not seeing it. 
this generic icon there. All right. So that's the only image in this application. All right. So nothing really exciting there. We have the three versions of it, the high density one being the largest one, then medium density, then low density. Our manifest looks pretty much the same as the previous example. We define the minimum SDK version of it and we have other aspects. We define what the icon for the application is, which is this guy here. Define that the app name is contained in the strings resource and so on down the line. Our strings resources file contains several things. It contains the greeting. It contains the name of the app. It contains a literal that's going to be the name of the button, calculate tip. And it contains an array for the choices. Along with a prompt, choose level of service. So again, all these string literals that you've seen in this application, when we run it, the application name, the greeting, the levels of service, and the literal that says calculate tip, all of those are in the string file. We then have our layout XML. which uses a linear layout. Linear layout, what do you suppose that is? It simply lays the, lays the elements out one after the other. That other application actually could have been done with a linear layout because we simply laid each element one after the other anyhow. So um, these are just different styles of layouts that you can have within an Android application. I have the text view that contains my greeting, all right, which it gets from the string file. I have an edit text view that's like the text box where you can enter in the, the text. And what's more, I specify that the input type is number. All right. So notice that by doing that, I, when I click on that text box, Notice that my keyboard, the letters aren't even enabled because I said it's a number. So I can only type in numbers. All right. Notice I also have an attribute of that that says request focus. What that means is when this screen loads, when this activity loads, that's where the cursor will be. So I put the cursor right in there so the user can start right away entering that stuff in. I then have a spinner control. A spinner control is like what you would call a drop down in other languages. It's where you have a choice of options. I specify the ID. I specify where it gets the entries for that. In this case, it gets it from the string file, but it's not simply a string, it's an array. So it finds the array and it will create an option for each of the items in that array. I have a prompt so that when I go into this field, prompt says what it is that I'm to do. I have a button. And then finally, I have a text view to hold the results. There's nothing in it to start, so there's no value. But after I put in the value and do the calculation, um, it will go and do that. All right. Let's now look at the activity. This activity is a little different than 
the previous one. These first two lines are the same. What am I doing in those first two lines? Well, I'm remembering some things about it in case I'm restoring the application. And I'm setting the main content view, which is the main XML. So, because I said main here, it finds the layout called main.xml and sets that as a content view, sets that as a screen of this app. I then do this. Let's take a look at this because this is like a really important line of code. So I'm going to write out the line of code on there and uh, we'll make sure that we really understand what it's doing. This line of code will be important because it will review some Java concepts as well as be critical in how this is going to work, uh, how these Android apps work. So. Let me write that line of code down. That line of code says button count equals button find view by ID r.id.calc We'll probably go back and forth between the dock camera and there. All right. So what does this mean? All right. Let's break this down and look at it one step at a time. Button calc what does that mean? If that was the only part of the statement, what would that mean? Right. What this is saying is, I have a button object, and its name is calc. So, calc is my variable, and I'm telling you this variable is going to be of type button. All right? This by itself doesn't tell me what button I'm pointing to yet. That's where the rest of the statement comes in. All this does is simply sets up a memory location that's going to hold a pointer to a button. One thing that's important to realize in Java terms is that all Java objects, object references, that is variables that point to objects, use pointers to point to an object. All right. So if I set one object to equal to another object, then it doesn't like copy that object into the new variable. It copies the pointer to it. So if I said something like this, If I did these three statements, I would have one student object in the memory that was pointed to by two object references, S and T. All right? That's important to understand. All right? Student S equals new student creates a student object. Student T says I have a variable that's going to hold students, and it's called T. T equals S says, Whatever object S points to, T points to that same object. But I still only have one student object. All right? I still only have one student object. Now, getting back to this example, I'm saying button calc equals, let's look at this first, find view by ID, r.id.calc. All right? Find view by ID. That is a method that exists as part of the activity. The activity has a method in it that says find view by ID. 
where you give it an ID and it finds the thing in the view that has that ID. Well, let's look at our layout here. What has a view of ID slash calc? That button does. So if I say button calc equals button, find view by ID, r dot ID calc, well what view has an ID of r dot ID dot calc? The button does. Alright. Now, the last piece of, of code here is this. Why is this needed? Why is that parenthesis button needed? What's that called, first of all, and why is it needed? That's called casting. Why do we need to do that? Get view by ID is going to return any kind of view, depending on the ID you give it. So if you give it a ID that corresponds to a text box, it'll return a text box object, or an edit text view is the proper Android terms. If I gave it the ID of a spinner view, it's going to return a spinner object. Again. All these things, all these different views that we can put on our UI inherit from the basic view. So when we say get view by ID, we don't know what we're getting back. We could get back any kind of view. Now, we've rigged the deck though. We know that that's a button, right? Because we coded it. We gave it that ID. So there's no guesswork for us. So by casting it as a button, we're giving a tip to the compiler that says, hey, we know that this is going to return just a generic view, a generic view object. Let's treat, but we know it's a button, so let's allow me to treat it as a button. So then what this does is it takes this and allows me to treat it as a button. So then I can assign to this button variable a button object. Why do I need to do that? Because I want to do button things with this. All right? I want to treat it like it's a button. I don't want to treat it like it's some generic view. Buttons have different methods than just a plain old text box, right? Namely, you can press a button, right? So I'm going to want to write some code to press that button and do something. All right? But before I write that code, that when you press that button, something happens, I first have to point to that button and say, hey, this is my button. I want to do something with it. Okay. We don't have time to wrap this up next time. I'll, I'll try to remember to put this application out so you can take a look at it uh, before next time, but we'll definitely finish it up next time. But know that when I do that, this line here is, whoops, this line here is important. We'll see this in every application. Because what this does is this connects our user interface to our processing code. We define that button in our main XML. So when we set that content view, that creates that view. And it creates all the objects contained in that view. So those objects are out there now, right? associated with this activity. We, however, have to point to those objects if we want to do anything with them. So those objects are out there as soon as we do that content view, set content view. But there's more stuff we have to do, right? We have to write some code for that button. And we have to access the value of the text box. And we have to access the value of the spinner control, and so on. All right. So in order to do something with them in our code, we have to grab a reference to them. So 
we'll be doing like these three lines in just about every activity we do because we're going to set the main view. Then we're going to grab pointers to stuff because our processing code has to obviously some manner interact with the, uh, with, with the layout. We didn't do that in the first example because we didn't do any processing. We just popped up that screen and, th and there you go. All right. Ideally, by Tuesday, you'll have everything installed so that you can run that welcome app and it runs using an emulator or an Android device and so we can build on that. It, you know, if possible, I'd like you to bring your laptops to class so that we can look at some of these examples uh, and, and then make tweaks to them. So first thing to do is, if you, is make sure you, you have the, the development envi environment installed. Secondly, I'll post this example, look at it, review the main portions of the main files associated with the Android app, and see if you can sort of get a sense of what these lines are doing, because that's where we'll pick up uh, next time. All right. Thank you. With any luck, we'll have a screen that is the correct color. <laughs>